listening to Your Ultimate Life with Kellen Flukiger, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello, 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 and welcome to this episode of Your Ultimate Life. In fact, welcome to Your Ultimate Life. Me and the Phoenix bird behind you, we're welcoming to a life, welcoming you to a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy. And to help us along today, I've got a special guest, uh, Pamela Richardson, who is a woman of many talents, capabilities, and experience. And I'm excited to have her uh, here join us. And uh, her picture's coming up. It'll be here in a minute. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what we're doing today. This show, the purpose of this show is to help you Mm -hmm. with ideas, with thoughts, with experiences, with stories, and with meeting fabulous guests to do just one thing. And the one thing is to create a life you love, a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy. Pamela, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kellen, for inviting me. You are so welcome. I was just excited to invite you because I love what you are about in the world. And I only have guests on here who I know have a message that's valuable and who are determined to do things. So I want to, rather than me telling anything about you, because I don't want to spoil the fun, I'm going to ask you in a very not modest way, how is Pamela adding good to the world? In many different ways. Um, I thought about that today. Sometimes you don't really realize all the things that you do. Um, But um, I am a paralegal by trade. I've been in the field for many, many years. Uh, I am a pastor. Uh, I serve the Life Changing Church Ministries. Um, we are involved in, involved in uh, different types of uh, service to the young, to young women, to tweens, to teens, to to the marginalized, those who are homeless, helpless, hungry. Um, I teach and I preach, uh, serve in many different ways. So uh, you do, and you, you've just barely scratched the surface. Uh, of of the things that I know about you, because I have the honor and privilege of knowing you for, for some time before this and having met you some time ago at an event we were at. So tell, tell me what made you decide to uh, get into the service ministry, the service of church and pastoring, ministering, that kind of thing. What is it that happened that made you go into that kind of service? Well, I really didn't start out thinking about being a pastor, but I was raised uh, in a Christian home, a faithful home. Home. My parents um, took us to church. We went to church um, and they taught us the Bible. You know, I attended Sunday school. I was on a junior usher, sang in the choir, um, many different things, activities in the church. And uh, as I grew of course, um, watching my parents, um, I began to develop in my own faith, a personal faith, a belief in God, which has helped me tremendously navigate all of the life challenges uh, that I have been through. So um, I have, I am a, um, next to the oldest, uh, I have an older sister. I have a sister that's um, uh, under me. And I had three brothers, two of which are um, have transitioned. I still have one brother left. Uh, I've experienced a lot of loss myself. So my faith has sustained me in the loss of my father at a very early age, actually 12. And I never really thought about how traumatic that event was. Um, I still, when I think about it now, it brings um, some sadness. But one of the things that I've been able to do is to really see how I may be able to help uh, through writing a book. I'm in the process of writing a book now for tweens um, to help them to navigate those uh, delicate years, those challenging years. Um, and to be able to become confident, 
to live out their purpose, to know that God has purpose for them, that they can take whatever they, they are going through and realize that uh, there is purpose in the pain. And to be able to come that, we have to give them tools to help them to get an understanding of who they are as um, as created by God, creating this image. And, and um, so there's a lot of things going on today. And I, it just... Anything that has to do with young people, young women, I'm all for. I actually have a program now um, that I'm involved with, a small group of women um, called the Your Ultimate Empowerment Program. And I'm hoping that with the tween, once I uh, publish the book, I'll be able to set up classes, individual classes, or one-on-one -on -one sessions, and also group sessions uh, with tweens. Because I've been with the church for a while, I have worked with organizations that have young people groups in them. So I'll be able to, um, to be able to share my book and my own experience uh, with people who are going through. Some are in church and some are not in church but to navigate uh, those very uh, challenging years. We have, a, we have a lot of stuff going on in the world. Like we have wars around the world in different places. We have a lot of polarization and disruption uh, here in North America. You live in the U.S., I live in Canada, but there's just a ton of that sort of stuff. And you suffering the loss of your father at that tender age, 12, I mean, that <clears throat> can be a really devastating thing. So I want you to explore with us for a minute, like, uh, and you've told me some of this stuff, but I want you to think about now in retrospect, what happened when you, when you lost your dad, I know you were raised in a faithful household, but when somebody dies, it like brings it front and center, like they're gone. And so what happened when your dad died and what, what did you th think about then? And, and talk us through a little bit about how you were able to cope with that mm -hmm. tragedy. Okay. Well, first of all, um, having two parents, um, living in a home where we were taught about God, even though those things were there, you're still a child. And mm -hmm. when my father first got sick, because he was the breadwinner, he was the one who went out to work. My mother was a homemaker. And so when he first got sick, we didn't realize how sick he was. And for a year, we went through my mother spending most of her time at the hospital, which meant me and my sister had to take care of our siblings. As I said before, it was six of us all together. So we had to help with getting those kids ready for school. We had to do some meals. We had to make sure they did their homework. We had to help them get dressed. And for me, so I, I didn't get a chance to really be a teenager. Uh, I, I wasn't, I, I was in fear. We were poor on the most part. We, we were, I, I want to say this about, we didn't have a lot, but what we had, you can't buy with money. And I say that because we had family, we had each other and that's what helped us to be able to, uh, to navigate uh, my father being sick and also him passing away. But it was still, there was a lot of fear for me because I didn't know how we were going to make it. I didn't know how we were going to eat. I didn't know we were going to wind up being on the street because my mother had not worked. And so we had to, me and my older sister, we had to, we had to be responsible and take the weight off my mother because she spent most of her time at the hospital. So mm -hmm. my, sis my sister did a lot of the um, preparing meals and stuff, simple meals. And I helped. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you had, you had, so the addition of responsibility, it's a bit of a distraction. When your father, this illness was done and your dad was gone, um, <clears throat> and your mom didn't have to go to the hospital anymore. Like what gave you, if you can remember, and, and at the time, you may not even have been aware of it. It just may have been, okay, this is life and this is what we do. But when you look back at it now, as you were, you know, 13, 14 during those years, what, like, you could either have been 
angry and resentful and you know negative that whole time. Why did this happen to me? Or you could have passed through that period a different way. And I, it doesn't matter what the answer is. But how did that affect you in the next two or three or four years as you started to go to high school and that kind of thing? Right. So uh, the fear was there. Um, I didn't really understand. I didn't grieve my father's loss. I didn't have time to grieve his loss. Uh, mm -hmm. But I felt very insecure. Um, I was, I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I was challenged in my uh, schoolwork. I was afraid that I wasn't going to do well. And actually, um, I didn't for a period of time. I didn't do well. So it affected my, my grades. It affected mm -hmm. Uh, me uh, being with other young people. I didn't talk a lot. I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't, I didn't have the money to, to socialize, to have the, you know, the cool clothes and, and go out and eat and stuff like that. I, I couldn't do that because we had to, when, when I would go to school, I would come back and I had to help uh, my mom. So I was, I was kind of lost and I was angry and fearful and but I didn't really have time to process those emotions. So, uh, but I definitely, my mother, because my mother was strong, she, she modeled, she helped me to be able to kind of sit these things, these feelings aside and just deal with the moment, deal with what I had to do, deal with. So, so I'm hearing several things. One, you didn't have time to process. It affected you in very profound ways. You didn't get to grow up like a normal kid and go do stuff because you had to go home and do other things. But your mom was strong and she was there for you in that way. As you grew older and, and sort of got out on your own, like when, did you, when were you able to start processing this and making your way in the world in a way that felt like, you know, you kind of owned something of your own life? I think I processed it a little bit. And I mm -hmm. say that because my father passed away when I was 12. So mm -hmm. between 12 and 14, I started actually started working when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. My working papers started working. And I wind up uh, getting left down um, in the 10th grade. And that was kind of a wake up call for me because I knew how my father always wanted us. He always talked about education. He always talked about, you know, once you learn something, can't, can't, no one can take it away from you. And so I realized that even though he was gone, the memory of him, the teachings um, that he taught me were still with me. And mm -hmm. they actually were the fuel for me to continue uh, to to do the things that I needed to do to get a, to get an education, and so I went on and um, I graduated from high school. I uh, went to college and uh, came out of college. I um, have several degrees. I I think probably and again with in terms of going into ministry. I think that I served in other ways, not, not like ordained ministry, because my mom taught us to serve and to love people. So we we always help people. You know, we would help people. My mother would feed people all the time. <laughs> we were, she was always beating somebody. Somebody was always coming to the house. They knew they could get help from her. Um, we shared a lot. We shared our clothes with people. Uh, with others, uh, family, not strangers, but uh, we things were passed down to to me. Like my sister's clothes were passed down to me. My mother was a seamstress, so a lot of the clothes that I had as a teenager, she made, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't like that. But I didn't have <laughs> <laughs> right. What what role do you think that you mentioned service? And you know, you know me. I think. Serve, we, I, we're built to love and serve each other. And it's clear to me that you have followed in that tradition. I'm curious, what role did the the service, the feeling that we, not just family, but we as a people 
are built to love and serve each other. What role did that play in your getting through this thing and then getting your, you know, moving on to college and sort of taking control of your life? What role did that love and service play for you? Well, I believe that love is empowering. I believe that when we serve and we help people, it empowers us. It gives us purpose. I know that uh, it helped me to come into the knowledge of the purpose that I believe God had called me to. Um, And so I served in, in a way initially before I actually started going into ministry, I served in terms of helping people who needed help, friends, helping people with studies, um, we, we had a youth, uh, a, to, 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 a tutorial ministry, can't get that out, tutorial ministry. So we used to help um, kids with their, their homework. Uh, I babysitted. I helped. Um, there was a, a couple ladies on our block who had young children and they trusted me to babysit. So I made a few pennies, you know, back then you, you didn't make a whole lot of money. But just helping, you know, uh, helping washing clothes, you know, helping people clean their houses, things like that. And then as I went to school and I decided that uh, I wanted to go into government, but I wind up um, working in the legal industry. And so I've been a paralegal for over 30 years and I found that in that industry, in that in the legal field, I help people because a lot of times people didn't know, you know, things about uh, paperwork and uh, and so I would talk to people and I would tell them my family, friends, anything I learned, I would you know I would share it with them to help them, you know, in their everyday life. So you know I what's really that interesting way. about that? Some people think knowledge is power, and so they withhold it. And everything that you've expressed all the way through is the opposite of that. You have been open and giving and sharing with knowledge, with help, with time, with love. And can what difference do you think that makes in who you are today, the fact that you chose then and still choose now to be a giver of love and hope as opposed to hoarding things like me, I got mine, you know, (laughs) the other way. Tell me how that affects you today. Well, I think when we love people, we share a little bit of ourself. And I believe love is healing. Um, Because I'm a um, believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus tells us, to help mm-hmm. those who are, are marginalized, the feet, uh, the hungry, the clothed, the poor, the, to, to help those who are hurting and helpless. Um, one of the things that I experienced um, was helping women that went through domestic violence. And I, I've never sh- talked to you about this before, but I used to serve as a volunteer for one of uh, a couple of shelters. And so just get just being with people and helping them and comfort, comforting them and praying with them and sharing practical ways in which they could make decisions in their life that empowered them, that their situation didn't have to be like it was. So when you share with people and you share ideas, because a lot of times we think about faith, but we're not able to apply it. So for me, being able to share my knowledge, my legal knowledge, my business knowledge, I have an associate's degree in business. Uh, So there are many different ways that I share with people in a practical way for them to be able to use it. Doing resumes, we used to have workshops at the church, uh, bringing uh, different facilitators and from different professions to give young people an idea about maybe a career that they or you know a career or profession that they might want to go in so i just loving people serving people i think brings empowerment not only for them but for me it gives me purpose uh, so i love that and there's a a real key piece that you've said and i want to just repeat it to emphasize the giving of service in listed half a dozen ways. But what I'm noticing is the giving of service not only helps the person you have helped, whether it's resume or legal stuff or 
a comfort or whatever it is, it also increases you. You yes. grow. You become more of a substantive person. And that is such uh, evidence that we're built to love and serve each other because the more we do that, the more there is of us. We become more substantive people. I'm going to share that with Joy. You don't know that, but you and Joy have that in common. Joy's volunteered and served at a, some women's shelters as well. So you don't know that about her, and she doesn't know that about you. So that's uh, <clears throat> that's a, a wonderful thing. So it's what made you go into the legal profession to be a paralegal for, you said, more than 30 years now? Yes. Well, initially, I started out because I needed a job. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, again, I went to school and my major was government. Mm -hmm. When I came out of uh, when I came out of college, I needed a job to be able to to take care of myself. And so I um, took some courses that had to do with administration, like executive administration. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first jobs that I had was working for a uh, criminal attorney. Uh, I think that was initially, I worked for her for about a year. And mm -hmm. then I um, went on to apply. I found that I actually liked the legal field. And it's funny because my I have, I have some uncles, they're deceased now, but they used to tell me that either I will become a lawyer or I will become a preacher. I don't know where they got that from. <laughs> it's it's amazing that really has come true, both of them, because I do all the work the attorney does, and I just can't go into court. Uh, so, well, that's so you finished that. I mean, you you started there, and then you finished getting certified as a, I don't know what all the names and processes are, yes. but you've mentioned a associate's degree in business, and you have a a degree in uh, being a legal uh, paralegal, which is a an official sort of thing. And that stuck with you. But that's kind of been the thing that you did both to serve and to create a living. And then somewhere in there, you got married and had kids of your kids of your own. Yeah, I got I got married actually at a later age um, because I was more concerned about my education. Like As I said, my father was he always talked about us getting an education. But one of the things that he said was, you, when, as you're learning, again, because they taught us to give back. And growing up as a Black person, you know, they wanted us to be able to sustain ourselves. So mm -hmm. education was a major thing for me. After I got left down and I thought about how disappointed he would have been, I was like, oh, no, I can't do this. And so um, I've always, you know, just kept moving, even through the grief, even through the loss. Now, I've lost um, not just my father, but I'm a widow. I've been a widow now for many, many years. Um, I raised my son pretty much. Uh, he was a he was a teenager too when uh, his his pet uh, his father passed away, um, but I don't know. It's like when there there are so many ways that we can lose, we can have loss in our life. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be the loss of health. It could be the loss of finances. It could be the loss of relationships. It could be the loss of. Uh, you know, it's all kinds of ways we, we, we can lose things, but the empowerment is to look at what you think you lost and realize that you don't need what you lost to move forward. So the foundation that was, I was brought up and helped me to move forward, even though I didn't grieve like I would have wanted to, but I didn't understand, but I just kept moving and the service was there because that's how my mother, she, she modeled that, you know, she was always helping people. She was always showing us loving on people. And so that's, that's what I knew. I, I, you said something that's just really, really profound for me. And I want to go back and explore that a little bit. And that was, you said, 
when you lose something, one of the most important realizations is that you don't need that thing to move forward. And I don't hear that in a callous way, meaning don't pretend you didn't lose whatever it is. You did, and you could and should grieve as appropriate, but you don't need that thing to move forward. And so many people have a loss, especially something that was inflicted on them, a disease they didn't ask for. They got cancer or a partner betrayed them or you know something bad happened, an act of violence or some other thing. And they, they stay stuck in that anger and frustration forever because that unjust thing happened to them. And you've said what one of the most important things is to realize not that you don't be sad, but that you don't need that thing to move forward. I want you to talk more about that because I think that's really important. I think that there are moments when, as you said, you have to acknowledge what has happened. But if there's no way to change that situation, you lose energy, time. Um, thinking about something or living in the past, again, because I'm a faithful person and because I believe the scriptures and I surround myself with people who push me like you, <laughs> but, 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 you know, really people who care about me. And so one of my passions, cause I love people. I, you can't help people if you don't have relationships with people and you can't, and you have to encourage people. So when you are having conversations, when you're getting to know people, when you're sharing your own story, it gives them something tangible to see, to say, okay, yes, I did have a loss. Yes, I am sad. And, and, and give yourself time to grieve because, all right, today I'm depressed. I'll be depressed for one hour. And after that, I got to go do this, you know, like <laughs> a time frame. Like you have to learn how to, to realize what the moment that you're in to validate it. But now, how do I continue to live? I couldn't bring my father back. I couldn't bring my husband back. I've even lost a daughter. I couldn't bring her back. So what do I do? I take their memory, the love that you, you never, the love doesn't die with people. So their love can empower you. The, the memory of them, as I said with my dad, all the things that he taught me as a child stayed with me even to this day he told me to you know be a woman of my word and one of the things that i realized just recently is while that was very important to me to be a woman of my word for other people but i have to also be a woman of my word when it comes to things that i'm telling myself that i want to do so if i say to someone else i'm going to do this and, and unless something happens to me and I can't do it, I do it. But I have to apply that same standard to myself. So I think when you open yourself up to experiencing life, to seeing the challenges as opportunities to grow and not as a way to, to be stagnant or, you know, uh, to think that, you know, I can't do this. But you need to surround yourself with people who can help you do that. You need help. And that's why I help people because I, I'm moving forward. I want you to move forward too. I love that. And it's easy to see and the passion as you get wound up, how come you're a preacher? <laughs> so holy moly, the blessed, you know, the blessings of the people in your congregation. Uh, I love that. And your passion for helping people, your passion for moving forward, for helping others and for being a beacon of light is so evident. And I love, I just love that uh, about you. As, as you've described all those things, a daughter, your husband, your dad, and, you know, you have experienced an extraordinary, and I guess everybody loses stuff. As we all get older, we lose people. I mean, I was talking to a client the other day who was just telling me that very recently they'd experienced two de deaths of very dear friends. So, I mean, that happens. But I want to know how your faith plays into that, your faith, because sometimes, often, not even sometimes, 
people's faith get tested when loved ones die, when stuff happens, even though we know we're all going to pass. Like with a lot of loss, you know, you buried your daughter, that's not, et cetera. And your, your son, you know, was a teenager when your husband passed. How has your faith interacted with that amount of loss? Talk to me about the relationship between loss and your faith. God is my all in all. What can I say? He gives me peace. The scriptures give me peace. And I say that because, again, not knowing as a child, you may not have a foundation in the scriptures and you may not even understand them. You can read them and still not be able to understand all that they say. But one of the things that helps me is to surrender my emotions, my feelings, to believe that God knows how, how I'm feeling, knows what, what's going on in my life. I believe he loves me, really loves me. That's his word says that he created me, he chose me, and he loves me. And he's called me to be an ambassador of love and service. So when we love on people, we are representing God. We are that tangible person that doing tangible things to show them God's love. And they may not want to hear scripture or anything like that. But when they see you, if they see the peace that you have, the love that you have, the compassion that you have, the mercy that you have. Because it's it, when you live this out every day, it becomes a part of you. You become your authentic self. You Christianity, being a believer in Jesus Christ, is a lifestyle for me. So it's not just about reading scripture. It's about living my faith out in a tangible way every day. You know, we live in a world right now where <clears throat> there's so much anger and animosity. Uh, people hate people they don't even know. And there's people that hate this race and that race. And and yet here you are boldly, clearly, loudly proclaiming that we're here to love and serve each other. So in, in your service, in your meeting people and having conversations, I know that you interact with and meet people who are not people of faith, who do not, you know, have their life based in scripture, who think that's all, yeah, whatever, maybe for weak people or mumbo jumbo or whatever. So where do you start with that situation? Because I know you and you don't just say, well, go away. You're not a person of faith, so beat it. So where do you start with that love with someone who, whose life experience has wandered through a minefield that's left them hurt and not, you know, not able to access that yet. You have to meet people where they are. And the first thing that you have to do is show them that you care. That may be in very small ways. People have to believe that you care about them and that you want to help them. And that starts with a conversation that starts with listening. Um, little things that that you do, a phone call, a text message, a card. Um, I know one of my friends went through a divorce and she had been married for a very long time. One of the things that I did, I just was to send her cards every now and then, like every few weeks I would send her cards to remind her that she's loved. So you do little things and that builds relationships. When people, people know when you're sincere, and so for me, I I don't, I want to be who I am. I can't be, I can be the best version of Pamela Richardson Smith. I can't be anybody else. And because my mother modeled that because she loved people and it helped me to see it. And so people have to see, they have to experience it. And through that love and action, they may be open to hearing about God because they see it in a tangible way. So they see you, they see you in this case, we're talking about you as God in, and love in action. So I'm going to switch gears here. You mentioned earlier about, um, I want to make sure we have enough time to do all the things I want to do with, 
your this conversation about writing a book. And I want you to talk about the book you're writing. And I want you to tell me why you're writing it, what you hope it does, and the the power and emotion that's in your heart that drives this work. Well, I didn't start out. It seems like things that I start out doing, I don't start out doing what I think I'm doing. <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I began to think about my own story and what I felt as a tween and how I overcame the challenges, a lot of challenges, being poor, not having a lot of friends, um, having to take on the responsibility uh, of helping um, take care of my siblings and home and, and just sacrifice. The ch young people today are experiencing the same thing, but it's just different. And so they need to know that we care. And so this book is a way to share my own reflections of what I went through, uh, body image. Uh, today, we are so caught up in how we look. Um, I was short, still am. <laughs> um, I was chubby. People used to tease me, you know. Uh, and so the, the, how I looked, you know, bothered me. I wanted to be slim and everything, you know, be like Twiggy or whatever. But tw teen tweens go through the same thing today, body image. They go through, um, you know, peer pressure. You know, what kind of peers do they have? They go through bullying, like social media. It's crazy with all the different things um, that they are experiencing. And they have nobody to talk to. And sometimes they feel like they are by themselves. And so we know that the suicide rate for uh, teenagers it's too high. It shouldn't be at all. And so my passion through my own story is to let them know that this is going to pass. Like this is a stage. Yes, you will feel uncomfortable. Yes, your body is changing. Yes, your mind is changing. Yes, you may not have all the things that you want. Yes, you may have challenges in school. You may not be doing well in school. Yes, you might, you might not have a whole lot of friends. You may not have, your parents may not have a whole lot of money. You may be in a home where you just have one parent. You may be someone that's adopted. Maybe you're in, a, in the system. There's all kinds of situations for young people today. We have to let them know that we love them and that this too will pass. But we can't do it if we don't share and be authentic and let them know, I, I, yes, I may be this age now, I may be 20 or 30 or 40 years older than you now. But those same emotions of insecurity and fear and anxiousness, you experienced it and so did I. And I, I love it because I've been able to see some of the work that you've done. And, and so tell me the name, tell us, the audience, the name of the book that's coming. What's coming? What is it? Okay, so the name the name of the book is um, from invincible from invisible. I'm sorry, from invisible to invincible: a tween girl's guide to self empowerment, and it discusses uh, self esteem. What does low self esteem look like? How you can actually overcome. Uh, low self-esteem, how it affects your mind and your body and your spirit. One of the things that's different, I believe, about my book is that it is scripturally based. It has scriptures that support not only my own story, but the uh, different types of challenges that come with being a tween. So each chapter has my story, my reflections, the principles, exercises, and it also has scripture that they can go and they can look at uh, and read and know uh, that they can overcome these challenges. And there's a biblical basis for that and that God is with them. You know, one of the things you said that I, I find not just with the population that you serve, the tween girls, but with everybody, is people feel so isolated they feel like they're the only one 
that ever dealt with this particular set of challenges and that nobody can possibly understand them. And, you know, 27 ways of saying that same thing. And what you're doing, I'm hearing, is sharing a very powerful truth that they're not alone, number one. Number two, that you and God love them and that there are other places they can turn to for support so they don't navigate this with isolation, which leads to depression, which leads to the kinds of you know, suicide rates and things that we're seeing. Um, what is it? How do you feel? about being vulnerable and sharing details of your story. For some people, that starts out to be really uncomfortable. And as you explore sharing all that with with people in a book, it's going to be public. The universe can see it. Talk about that, that sharing and that vulnerability a little bit. You have to press through the fear. And I'm, there are moments when I still have some fear but it's only in my mind because it's my story it's not only my story but telling telling my story and looking at how my story did not define who i am that in spite of all the challenges in spite of all the different things the the, the depression the the loss the the economic situation it did not stop me. Telling your story is powerful because then they realize that they are too, that there is some similarities in our stories as human beings. I may not be the same age, but we experience emotions that have to do with being a human being. And we need love and we need companionship and we need to be in community. And we need to be able to say, you know what? I'm going to walk with you with this. I don't have all the answers. Let's go find the answers together. And, and as you just take one step. So the book, being able to understand that my story will help, if it helps one person know that they're not alone, that somebody else has been through this, but they've survived it, to know that there are support systems out there that can help them um, find their way, that they don't have to give up, um, that they don't have to feel that they're by themselves, that God is with them, even if they don't feel like it, because faith is not feelings. And I had to learn that. Faith has to do with something that God, I believe, put on the inside of us, that in spite of what we see, we know that we can overcome it with his help, with talking to him, with talking to other people through prayer, like different spiritual disciplines, the different things that we can do to build our inner man up and to really have our mind transformed. There's a scripture, Romans 12, one and two. It says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can't have a change of mind if you're thinking the same thoughts. So uh, there's, a, there's a saying that you're not gonna get a different result if you keep doing the same thing, you're gonna get the same result. So you gotta step out. Yes, it's scary. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus tells Peter to step out of the boat. As long as he, as he was focused on Christ, he, he didn't begin to sink. And so this book is like, come, I, I, I have your hand. I'm going to take your hand. I'm going to show you what I went through. I'm going to tell you that you can make it. I'm going to give you some, some scriptural foundations. I'm going to give you some other resources. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some principles that you can begin to look at and write down and exercise and begin just little steps because that's sometimes it gets so overwhelming. We think we get paralyzed with fear and we don't know where to go, who to talk to, or even where to start. And so as I've navigated my journey, I want to live a full life. I want to live and living means helping other people, loving people, serving people, telling them you can do this. You can make it. And I'm going to walk with you. If it's through a book, teaching, preaching, whatever.
service. So there can be no doubt from people that are listening to you how passionate you are about this. So now we've talked about this tween book, and you talked about creating a follow-up thing. So the book will be done in the next few weeks, right? Yes. Okay, good. So then then there'll be... Uh, I want you to, to talk about one more thing, and then I want to make sure people know how to follow you and how to find you. But let's talk about right now. I know besides the girls, the young girls, you also work with women. Uh, you have a women's empowerment group that does many of the same things, help them feel not alone and give them the kind of support. You mentioned your friend who was going through a divorce and so forth. Tell me a little bit about your work with empowering women. About Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. So for many, many years, uh, I have worked with different organizations, again, some in church and some outside of the church. And basically it's about education. It's about uh, loving, loving them where they are, giving them the tools, whether it's educational wise, showing them how they can make steps uh, to a better life. And also to come out of situations that may be harmful for them or seek help, whether it's a counselor, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever it is that we be able to help them to connect with people if we don't have the resources to connect with other people. So we have all kinds of workshops. We have one on ones. I've done counseling um, one on one. I've done group. We used to have a, a, a group called uh, Time Out for Women uh, for many, many years. And again, we did many different things dealing with the mind, body, and spirit. Because when you serve, you have to look at the human person as more than just body. They have a mind. They have a soul. Uh, they have desires. They have passion. They have skills and talents and gifts that God has given them. And sometimes they don't know how to discover those things. So in, in talking to women, and, and the other key thing, too, is listening. We've got to listen to people. They want to be heard. And they can be speaking and never say a word through their actions. So, so one of the things... Uh, I. I'm sorry, finish that sentence. No, I'm, I'm good. Uh, all right. So what I want to make sure that we do is you've talked about a, a wide range of things, being alone, listening, counseling, groups, the tweens. Uh, we didn't really talk about your church much. Uh, what I'd like you to do, we just have a few minutes left, and I'd like you to tell people where to follow you, find you. Where can people find out about your church? Where can they find out about the group you have, the Women's Empowerment Group? Where will they be looking to see more information about the book before it actually comes out? Like where, if, if someone hears this and they say, wow, that woman's on fire. I want to know more about her stuff. Where are they going to go? Okay. So I, I have a Facebook page, personal. It's Pat, just if you go um, search for Pamela Smith, you'll see my face. <laughs> It'll come up. Um, I'm on Twitter, same thing, Pamela Smith. Also, the church is connected to my page. So if you go to one, you'll wind up seeing things from the other page. Life Changing Church is spelled with two L's, Life Changing Church. And God gave me that name. What, what, now, what do you mean two L's? Life has two L's? Life has two L's. All right, so that would be L L I F E changing yes. church. So life changing yes. church starting with two L's. Yes. Okay, cool. Keep going. The reason why I believe that God gave me that name is because living your life for Christ, your life will be changed forever. If you have an encounter with Christ, your life will be changed forever. And he will love on you. And he will draw you unto himself and you will be healed. You will continue in that healing process until he comes back for his church. So Life Changing Church, Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram. Um, yeah, th those, those uh, are the ways that you can get in touch with me. And the church's phone number is on there. My phone number is on there. The email address is on those uh, social media sites. And um, 
you know, you'll, you can hear about the, the, the UPEP group, uh, your ultimate empowerment program. I have some stuff on there. We're actually getting ready to start a group in April. Okay. And, yeah. So that's coming up and I'm getting ready to do a master class on fear. <laughs> Wonderful. Pamela, You've been a delightful, uh, certainly energetic and powerful uh, guest today. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your heart, your soul, your journey, your passion, your love, and the strength that you get from your relationship with God and Christ. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. And yes, just, just search for me. You'll find me. Thank you. So I, I, as listeners, I want you to take this opportunity to go back and listen. Listen to this. She's been through hardships and difficulties. So have you. She's been through struggle and loss. So have you. But she has chosen not to allow it to ruin her, but instead to refine her. And now beyond being refined herself, she is passionate, if you can't tell, about loving you, serving you, hearing your needs and challenges, and helping you realize how precious, how important, and how powerful you are today, no matter what you've been through or where you've been. And I promise you, as you love yourself, as you search for more about Reverend Pamela's work and her processes, you will have more tools and more encouragement to create your ultimate life. You're listening to Your Ultimate Life with Kellen Flukiger, only on LA Talk Radio.